extend a warm welcome to you today. Everyone is welcome here. This community is a safe place where we support each other in the sacred task of becoming, celebrate the transcending mystery of life, and rely on the transforming power of love. The above theme of the month is beloved community. The focus for today is disability. <laughs> and here is a statement issued by the Accessibility and Inclusion Ministry no of the Unitarian Universalist Association. Access accessibility and inclusion ministry considers the uniqueness of the individual as a gift to be valued and appreciated by our congregations. AIM congregations accept a responsibility to counter, to counter society's tendency to make inclusion and accessibility the responsibility of individuals and instead transform our congregations and our society to be welcoming to inclusive and inclusive of people of all abilities. That statement from the uh, UUA. I was uh, taken by the Stephen Hawking quote on the front of today's bulletin, at least part of it. Don't be disabled in spirit as well as physically. Uh, two people came to my mind. I had a cousin who was almost exactly my age. He went to my high school. We went to Vietnam. He went to Vietnam in 1969. Three weeks after his return home, he went to the back shed, to a back shed on his mother's farm, put the barrel of a shotgun in his mouth and ended his life. He did not leave a note. I also had a friend who was a year behind me in high school. My friend loves cars and even as a teenager, he could fix about anything with four wheels. I remember one time I needed a water pump for an old car I had. We all drove old cars in high school back then. He went out to the local junkyard and found a wrecked car with a white with the right pump. And even though the thermometer was hanging around zero degrees with snow on the ground, he unbolted and pulled the pump in record time. He went to Vietnam a few months later than my cousin. When he came back, he was missing both his legs above the knee. The years passed and I lost track of him. 20 years later, when I returned for a visit to the area for my 20th class reunion, I decided to look Perry up. I found him working in an auto repair garage. He was sitting in a wheelchair that was covered in grease and grime. He was, however, neatly dressed in a clean work uniform, his empty pants legs pinned up and folded neatly underneath him. It turned out that he was married to his high school sweetheart <clears throat> with three teenage daughters and was the owner of the garage. He had three employees, one of which was a secretary. We fell to talking about his handicap, that was what we called disabilities then. When he came home from Vietnam, they fitted him with prosthetic legs. After a few months, because the legs did not have knees, 
he leaned the legs in the corner and left them claiming, left them there claiming dust, saying that they were more of a hindrance than a help. He would, he said, often go weeks without thinking about his missing legs. He had the time lived longer without his legs than with. Our conversation petered out as it is, uh, is it is the way with things go when you are catching up. So I took my leave as I did bid him farewell. I observed him smoothly lower himself onto a floor creeper and slide in one graceful motion under a car. As I exited the building, I heard the clink of riches as he did the thing he always had loved the best. After the service today, we will have our breakout room circle talk. I hope you will stick around. It is the most important part of the service. One outstanding feature of Buff is that this is a place where, as the old theme song goes for the TV show Cheers, everyone knows your name. Now let's move on to our announcements. Uh, I want to mention, and I want to mention one thing, uh, we have orientation uh, this uh, Wednesday for all who are interested. And uh, we do, I do mean everyone, not just if you're new, but everyone who would like to get to know uh, newer members better and uh, to understand a little better how things work here at Buff. Uh, also though, but I have to say that uh, last week when we had our orientation, everyone got in free, but this week there's a small fee uh, uh, that will go along with it. And that fee is that you have to bring, I'm, or at least I'm hoping you bring, uh, that you will bring a uh, 30 to 45 second elevator speech. And I'm hoping it will be an original speech. Now uh, I say that, uh, and but it doesn't have to be original. You can uh, just Google one on the internet and uh, combine two or three of what of the elevator speeches you find there. An elevator speech, for those who don't, do not know it, is the answer you give in a 30 second elevator ride to someone who asks you, what is a Unitarian Universalist? So uh, please come. On Wednesday night, everyone is welcome. And if you can, bring your elevator speech. Are there other announcements that we need to be made aware of? Are that uh, we need to amend our subtract from? They are printed at the end of your bulletin. Uh, Christina and I have an announcement. Uh, Christina and I are both theater directors, and this summer we will be directing plays at a local theater company called Ghostlight Theater. You may have seen our uh, biographies and information about that in uh, recent uh, Buff announces. And this uh, Wednesday, if you're not going to the uh, uh, Buff orientation, we are having a Meet the Directors night uh, that'll be on Zoom so that you could find out about the shows that we're putting on this summer. I'll be directing a show called Small Mouth Sounds, and Christina will be directing a Shakespeare production um, towards the end of the summer. So we're really looking forward to it. And if you want to find out more, you can uh, you can certainly uh, just text us or email us, and we'll we'll tell you more about our shows. Uh, open casting. So if you are the slightest bit interested in being in a production, we want to see you. Um, all of the auditions will be virtual. And then once the summer hits, we will do in-person and we'll be doing social distancing and masks or whatever is required for that. So we look, we look forward to seeing uh, any, anyone who you may know or you if you're interested in doing some theater this summer. Uh, excellent. Thank you, Les. Les, uh, would it be okay to put that in the Buff Announce if you could send that link to uh, Joanne? Absolutely, yes. will do. Yeah, that way uh, it can uh, get out to everyone and even those who might not be in attendance today. So, okay, so something to look for. What time of the day is that gonna be at? So we have the uh, Meet the Directors is going to be at 6 p.m. Uh, this Wednesday. And then the auditions uh, are in a couple of weeks and that'll be like, a, I think it's a, a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, all, all via Zoom. Okay, well, thank you, Les. And in case you're wondering, that does not overlap with the uh, the orientation. So you can make both those Zoom meetings if you'd like. So uh, thank you, Les and Christina. Uh, are there other announcements? Julie has one. Um, uh, on Thursday, the Econ Club is going to be discussing social justice advocacy. Uh, 
the panelists are Danny Jennings, Charmay Sanders, and Mary Jo Schnell. Uh, you can uh, uh, get the information at the mendelcenter.com. Uh, you need a ticket and they're asking for donations. I mean, the donations can be as much as, uh, as a couple of dollars. It's, uh, it's on the uh, Mendel Center website. Ah, thank you, Julie. Others? If not, let's uh, continue with our service. Now Vicki Dwyer Thomas will light our chalice. I appreciate being asked to light the chalice today because I'm interested in our theme of physical disabilities. My husband who passed away several years ago was physically disabled for years and years and in a wheelchair, et cetera. And so therefore I'm very aware of the importance of accessibility and of having a positive attitude, which he did. And um, I was, I think I'm gonna talk more on, before I light the chalice, on a couple incidents we had that kind of relate to our church group. The first example was the church I was attending for part of the time uh, years ago was a beautiful old, very rich church actually, but it had stair, uh, lots of stairs that made it handicap inaccessible. And I asked them about putting a ramp in and the answer I received was that it wouldn't be aesthetically pleasing. They didn't think, even though they had several entrances, they thought a ramp would not be pleasing. So of course we ended up going to another church and a good part is they did get a new minister soon after and they got a ramp. But a, a, a second incident I'd like to mention was I was working in a library and they had only one handicapped parking place. And I noticed that they were putting all of the snow, like our snow, in the parking place for handicapped people to one place. And so I asked, you know, why are you doing that? And they said, well, handicapped, physically handicapped people shouldn't come out in the bad weather. They, you know, they should be staying home and having things delivered to them. And, you know, I was surprised by the answer, but I said, I don't really know that that's right. And, you know, I think that might even be illegal. And well, you know, about an hour later, all the snow was moved. So, you know, it is important that we're aware of handicap accessibility. And now that I've had not had to deal with this for several years, I myself stopped noticing as much as I should. And as much as an attitude is good, being able, to, what we can help with is good too. So, um, I'm hoping that by listening today about physical challenges, it'll make us understand a little more the importance of understanding how everybody has something to contribute and that we should not discrim discriminate to, on any factor. So I'm lighting the chalice today in the hope that we will be accepting to all and discriminating to none. Thank you, Vicki, and amen. And now uh, let's uh, read our affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. Let's uh, go to one of my favorite parts of sermon service, uh, Story for All Ages, read by Catherine Lyon. Okay, um, today I'm bringing you this book, You Matter by Christian Robinson. I learned about it at this past year's General Assembly and it's part of our uh, Buff Library. So you're welcome to borrow it if you wanted to. 
So the inscription says, for anyone who isn't sure if they matter, you do. The small stuff, too small to see. Those who swim with the tide and those who don't. The first to go and the last, you matter. When everyone thinks you're a pest, when something is just out of reach, when everyone is too busy to help, you matter. If you fall down, if you have to start all over again, even if you are really gassy, you matter. That's my favorite page. Sometimes home is far away. And sometimes someone you love says goodbye. Sometimes you feel lost and alone, but you matter. Old and young. The first to go and the last. It's the same. The small stuff, too small to see. You matter. The end. Thank you, Catherine. Very good. That was a very lovely, lovely reading for us. Uh, now let's turn to our offering. And uh, we will, the words will pop up and let's read those words together. This fellowship is a community of ourselves. Its resources are our resources. Its wealth is what we share. As we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm our lives within it. And thank you all for your generosity. And now our hymn.
Lock up. Okay, thank you, Harvey and Nan, for that lovely song. And uh, thank you, Joanne, for those uh, beautiful uh, photographs that you took of the grounds around our church that we haven't been to for a long time. So thank you for that. Um, let's now uh, turn to our readers, and uh, Jordan Beasley will speak first. Jordan. Thank you, Jim. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Um, so I, I feel pretty honored to be asked to speak on this weekend in particular when the themes are both community and disability. As a veteran of the U.S. Armed Service with a physical disability myself, I think a lot about what a community can do and what a community should do for uh, its members who have these disabilities. I think about some of the things that have already been mentioned today, like accessibility in the form of ramps and parking spaces and things like that. But I also see things from the other side of the coin. I see the things uh, that are offered to me as a uh, disabled member of my community and um, it's different than before I, I got injured. I used to and I still do I used to teach martial arts and teach disabled students and encourage them to be resilient to be positive and to focus on what they can do in their goals and I was surprised and bewildered and hurt when I found out that it's harder to do than it sounds. Being resilient is incredibly important no matter what is going on. Being resilient when you feel the mental anguish of your physical pain is also incredibly important. That mental anguish can come no matter what your disability might be because you might feel that you are a burden to your community. It's a, it's a heavy sense of guilt to carry. So I want to remind people in our community here and for you guys to you know go and talk to your friends and your family, remind them that they aren't a burden to you. It's important for them to hear that. And remember that people don't always look like they're disabled. Not all disabilities are visible going to help people in our community be resilient and they know that they have the support of their loved ones and they know that they have the trust of their members that they're in this community with. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you. That was very, very lovely sharing you did with us right now. And now uh, some more meditation music. Shape of joy. 
Would you like to introduce the video at all? Uh, hi, this is my video. Um, I know it's a little bit long. I tried cutting it down. It took quite a few takes, but I did include a lot of different information. I think you'll find interesting. So there you go. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, here's my lecture today on disabilities. I have both invisible and visible disabilities. That includes lipedema, if you see in the picture. It's considered a rare fat disorder. Made me supersize. Some of you have heard me talk about it a bit. Um, it's not an easy one to deal with, as you can see in the picture. Here's uh, another picture from a lipedema support group that talks about supporting ourselves and having positive self-talk, which is necessary. The illness like lipedema. And here's Marilyn Wan, who's a fat activist, talking against stereotypes and prejudice towards fat people. And especially, this can be pretty hard on those who have health problems like lipedema. I have a lot of autoimmune disorders. It can happen to people with high stage lipedema. Um, I deal with a variety of autoimmune problems, lung and hormonal problems too. I lost most of my hearing from Meniere's, which I've had for over 20 years. People with disabilities often struggle to fit in and make friends, you face rejection. You know, some people can get some rejection from their family. I dealt with that with, the, with relatives I used to have. Um, health problems are seen as weakness in too many circles. It's not right. And here, you know, people have physical barriers too. They got to deal with them in the wheelchairs. I'm in a walker, so I got to deal with some of those. So I can do a few stairs, and but I can't do whole flights. And in the cartoon, they're saying to Bill, "Sorry, Bill, we'll try to get a ramp for those stairs before our next dinner party. Need more potatoes?" That can be something disabled people face, especially you know, people with mobility problems. And the one thing in American society it can be hard, you know, disability can sidetrack or stall careers. I had an art education bachelor's. I was in art education where I was an art teacher for three to four years at a juvenile home. I was a residential counselor. I tried becoming a paralegal as I was getting sick because I thought it'd be less physically taxing. And I wasn't able to do that, but I didn't, didn't enjoy the time I got to be in the school. But one thing about American society is everything is on achievement and production and what have you, what have you done with your life? Um, one thing that's important is I have focused on, you know, trying to do what I can and I see some things I've done in life is worthwhile, like my volunteer work in past blogging, moderating support groups art projects and involvement with other causes. Those things are important too, but even if someone doesn't have the energy or they've aged out of more activities while they're being disabled, 
they're still a worthwhile person today, no matter what they do. So that's important as well. If you realize that staying alive for the disabled can be hard, you know, you have to spend your days doing a lot of medical things. For me, it's like time in the leg machine, um, breathing treatments, physical therapies, uh, keeping track of medicine. Um, that can fill your day up alone. I mean, a lot of people with disabilities have to eat special diets and cook a lot more than the average person. Um, so I struggle with fatigue too, which can bring me good and bad days. And time often goes very fast for me, which is something that I know is different, especially being inside every day from COVID and I don't have all those other activities. Disability Network was a group I joined locally around six to eight years ago. I started going to their groups and they had lunches and seminars. And it's been a pretty important group. I'll be mentioning more of them. Uh, another group I belong to is NAFA, National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance. And I've also found online friends in the Asburgers and like the DEMA communities. I actually have a group of friends who are on the autistic spectrum that I've been talking to online since 1999. And we have a, our own private group on Facebook, all 11 of us. So some of those people are some of my closest online friends. Disability Network taught me a great deal about the history of disability rights and heroes like Julie Human and, and Edward Roberts and the 504 sit-in in the 1970s, which was like a precursor to ADA, and where they were fighting for public access for to buildings. Um, Being Human is a book that I also have recently read, and she's a very um, encouraging activist, and she's still out there. I was actually in a book club with her when she was talking about her book on Zoom. So I got to say hello before in person. So that was kind of interesting. Um, I went to a disability and media seminar where we talked about the changes needed and how disabled people are pictured in movies and TV. Um, too often there's broken people or where the disability is the focus or the, the villains. Even Darth Vader would be considered a um, a villain who's disabled, as you know, if you know the story from um, those movies. Inspiration porn, you can see here, Define, where you always see, you see these superstar disabled people on TV and in movies. And that's one thing that can be negative towards the disabled. I learned about ableism too where they, you know, it, it's a set of all the practices and beliefs that assign inferior value to people with a variety of disabilities. Um, they empowered me to learn how to stand up against ableism in my own life. I make a stand for myself and for others. And that's, you know, it's important. Before I even learned about the concept, I didn't realize how it impacted my life and those of others. Um, Neuroclastic was one of the autism communities I belong to on Facebook, and they've been very supportive. They stand against ableism with people on the autistic spectrum. And the one thing I did face when this happening is like um, in America, like the people that believe in the prosperity gospel and some beliefs in other religions, even the New Age. Think of the book The Secret. They see disability as God's or the divine's punishment for not living right, not staying positive, or not trying hard enough. As horrific as they are, such attitudes do fit the American model of healthcare being a privilege instead of a human right. Um, when you're disabled, too many less enlightened attitudes will focus on fixing you. Many conservative religions teach your main prerogative should be just praying to be healed every day. We're just supposed to wait until you're healed to have a life. Or they tell you your lack of faith has put you in poor health. And I believe these things do negatively affect um, disabled people. Too many toxic things in religions. 
you know, they sometimes they write supernatural checks that can't be cashed. <laughs> people people find themselves uh, facing, you know, some negative things from that. I've been U. I was U. U. by seventeen, and I stayed E. U. U. into my thirties. I was even married in the U. U. Church of Evanston, and one thing that happened to me was I was living in this remote small town, and I got very sick in my mid thirties, and um, I basically started attending evangelical churches, kind of like seeking answers. My husband never converted in. He, he remained with basically you, you beliefs. But he even told me then he, he knew I was trying to um, deal with what happened to me. I had almost died of an infection in my 30s. And some of the health problems were just, you know, what I had gone through piling up on me. And I remember all those, you know, that's how I got lured into there. But I was happy after, you know, different experiences. I left the evangelical church behind. I was happy to return to the UU. Buff is a far more positive place for the disabled. I believe the attitudes are far more healthy. And you all have stuck, you know, you stick to the first principle. And, you know, the level of acceptance and love and care for the disabled is far different. It's not, it's for accepting a person as they are today, not waiting until they're fixed. And that was a major change in my life to basically switch things around. Um, one thing I learned about was self-advocacy and disability rights. You know, my supportive communities, including Buff, all helped me to survive, especially since I've been disabled so long. I mean, I'm into my 50s now, and, you know, I've always tried to work on things and keep going. But I could finally celebrate my own uniqueness and own my own story. I didn't have to apologize just for existing, almost like that was the attitude in those former communities, the former religious communities. I mean, disability pride is about empowering ourselves and recognizing that we can contribute without feeling ashamed or silence. It is about owning our story and who we are. Disability pride also says you can and deserve to be part of a community, have access to that community and be included in the world. You can have those who care and support you, love and support you, and you can use your tools of self-advocacy. Those are all things I learned which made my life a lot better. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for that uh, window into your life. We are very proud of you for all you do and for all you bring uh, to us here at Buff. And now our final hymn. This is Magic Penny, written by Melvina Reynolds. I hope you'll sing along. Thank you, Gretchen, for that lovely song. I, I, I think I would like that to be my theme song. Thank you. I have not heard that, never heard that one before. Uh, and let's turn now to back to Vicki for our chalice extinguishing. I'm going to read uh, uh, something from Amy Morgenstern. She's a California 
do you minister? Never has it been more true than now. We extinguish this flame, but the sparks within us remain alight. From each of us in our supposed solitude, the signals buzz and hum, sparkling through space one to another, connecting us invisibly. We are one from every window, our light shines. And I'm in. And let your light shine, my, my friends. And uh, let's go to our musical benediction.